Thank you very much. Uh, I bring you greetings from uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada, way up north, and uh, specifically from our Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Narrative, which is a, a mouthful when you try to say it after a, a glass or two of uh, wine or whatever. <laughs> uh, so we round that off to just CIRN, C-I-R-N, which is not to be confused with that place in Switzerland where they swirl atoms around together and produce all kinds of subatomic particles. Thank you very much, Sarah. Sarah has uh, gracefully agreed to sit handy in case I, I get all mixed up in switching from one slide to another. It's a thrill and an honor to, uh, to be here and to share with you a few ideas and concepts that I work with on a fairly regular basis, and I present them to you uh, in an open-ended kind of way if they are helpful for you as you make connections in your own uh, explorations of narrative, then that's great. Uh, as counselors or counselors in training or professors of counseling, you are the experts in what we're here about this evening, and I'm particularly looking forward to the second half of the evening when I can sit down and enjoy. <laughs> Um, so you're the experts. I'm offering some ideas from, uh, from my academic uh, field in narrative gerontology, and as I say, I hope they're helpful to you. I did make available, and some of you, maybe all of you have, the little handout uh, with my PowerPoint slides, uh, and they will, that, that handout will come in handy for the pop quiz at the end of my presentation. Also, I've, I've uh, brought along with me a bibliography of a variety of sources from different disciplines, that I have found useful uh, that may be of use to you as well. And they're up front here if you want to pick them up uh, uh, when I'm done. So let's get underway. Oh, I also want to introduce or say hello to my niece, Laura Cook, who is a licensed professional counselor here with us this evening uh, from Suffolk, Virginia. So we have some Virginians, uh, I think, in the room. Um, other Virginians. You're a Virginian, aren't you, Don? Georgian now. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I think I'd like to be a Georgian as well. You don't have nearly as much snow down here, I gather, as we do. So a little bit of an overview of what I want to talk through tonight. I want to talk a little bit about narrative across the human sciences. I want to talk a little bit about my own particular area, which is narrative gerontology, and then open it up to uh, looking at uh, some <coughs> concepts such as narrative identity, narrative development, narrative environment, and what I'm calling sort of with inverted commas narrative disorders, and then move to the uh, related concepts of narrative care and narrative self-care, and then wrap up with some ongoing considerations that I think are important. A couple of quotations. I'm a collector of quotes. I sometimes think that anything that I've written is just a bunch of quotations that have charmed me, and I'm trying to figure out a way to link them together in some sort of supposedly logical way. Here's one from the literary scholar Barbara Hardy. We dream in narrative, uh, we daydream in narrative, we remember, anticipate, hope, despair, believe, doubt, plan, revise, criticize, construct, gossip, learn, hate, and love by narrative. So she seems to think narrative is kind of a neat thing. It's part of human experience. And then from Jean-Paul Sartre, who are the people that I met last year at the conference in Paris? Ah, bonjour, très bien. <laughs> So this is Jean-Paul Sartre, the French philosopher. He says, a man, woman, person, is always a teller of tales. He lives surrounded by his stories and the stories of others. He sees everything that happens to him through them, and he tries to live his life as if he were recounting it. That is Jean-Paul Sartre. Every time I say Sartre, I get an itchy feeling in my nose. <laughs> narrative across the human sciences. Well, the so-called narrative turn as a number of you are aware, has made its impact on a, a variety of uh, academic disciplines and professional fields as well. Psychology, most notably, narrative psychology is a recognized subfield of psychology uh, per se. Sociology, anthropology, theology. When I uh, first began to be fascinated by narrative, I was a divinity student myself and studying something that was then being called, back in the late 70s, narrative theology. Education is a field that has been very much uh, uh, taken with narrative approaches to understanding teacher development. Neurology, some neuroscientists are suggesting that uh, storytelling is hardwired into our brains. That's the way we think, okay? I, don't, I can't say more about that because I'm not a neuroscientist. I probably need one, but I'm not one. And the field of medicine itself. Rita Sharon's uh, 
a massive book, Narrative Medicine. Uh, she's based at Columbia University. So the narrative turn uh, is, you know, it's gaining momentum, I think, because we can look to a, a number of dimensions of, of human life, cognition, narrative thinking, narrative intelligence, emotion. I'm, I'm fascinated with the, the, the narrative complexity of our emotional lives. Identity, I'll get to that shortly. Personality, our relationships, love, the narrative complexity of love. Well, I could, I could do a whole lecture on that. Uh, the narrative complexity of our behaviors, our actions, our decisions, our beliefs. And I'll get to that a little bit later on. Human beings, to use a, a fancy word, are hermeneutical beings. We're interpreting beings. We make sense. Something that, as far as I know, the squirrel that comes to the feeder at my backyard doesn't do a lot of. Likes to eat a lot of sunflower seeds, but probably doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about the meaning of his or her life. Maybe so, but I, don't, I can't penetrate the squirrel language. Um, homo neran, someone has coined that phrase. Homo sapiens, homo neran. So if we are interpreting beings, if we are meaning-making creatures, that one of, our, one of our main means of making meaning is by telling, imagining, composing, sharing stories. It was just led the, the psychologist Theodore Sarban uh, to write about narrative or story as a root metaphor for psychology itself. His great collection, 1986, The Narrative Psychology, The Story Nature of Human Conduct, is, a, I think, a must read. Every narrativist, if I can use that term, will have his or her own story of coming to narrative, okay? Or seeing that narrative is an important uh, topic to explore. And I have my own story as well, and I want to share a little bit of that with you. But first, some more quotations, why not? I often start workshops or classes in narrative gerontology with this wonderful quotation from the novelist Alex Haley, um, who in an interview once, after the book Roots came out, I made the comment to the interviewer, every time an old person dies, it's like a library burns down. Christina Baldwin in her book Story Catchers, every person's born into life as a blank page, every person leaves life as a full book. Well, that blank page concept I think is debatable because we come into this world trailing the stories of our parents, our grandparents, our communities, our cultures, and so forth. But the central insight that we leave life as a full book, I really like that. And then lastly, Carolyn Miss, we are all living history books. Our bodies contain our histories. The lines in our face, the postures, the gestures that we have, the looks in our eyes. So narrative gerontology. One of the things that we, and I have to say that narrative gerontology is a very small and pretty marginal subfield of the multidisciplinary uh, field known as gerontology. And we don't get a lot of hearing at the standard sort of gerontological conferences, believe you me. But that's okay, it makes us feisty and, and all the keener to do what we do. I say we, I mean my colleague Gary Kenyon, uh, and a number of us that sprinkled around the world that are really exploring biographical aging, as distinct, if you will, from bio biological aging. We know lots about biological aging, and that's really important to know a lot about, but that's not the whole story of the aging process. So we're looking more at, shall we say, the ins, the rich, fascinating, interesting inside of the aging experience as opposed to the outside. The meanings in our memories, for example, more so than the mechanics of how short-term memory and long-term memory and sensory memory change with age. It's been said that gerontology uh, and perhaps our society as a, as a whole has been dominated by what could be called a narrative of decline as regards understanding what aging is. Aging is perceived as a, a downward slide. We narrative gerontologists like to say, again, that's not the whole story. Uh, aging is as much about growth as it is about decline. It may be growth because of the decline, the physical decline. It's about growing, the potential of growing old as opposed to just resignedly, passively getting old. So we look, we're looking, as Don has mentioned, uh, as Dean uh, Danhauser has mentioned as well, we're looking at wisdom as a potential outcome, uh, increased compassion as a potential outcome, in, insight in, into spirituality as a potential outcome of the aging experience. We also, I certainly think of the developmental tasks of later life 
as on many levels, narrative tasks. That there's a story work that awaits us in the second half of life. Carl Jung makes a comment somewhere about how the second half of life, and I'm definitely in that myself, it holds unparalleled potential for personal growth. And my colleague Mark Freeman at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts, talks about uh, later life as the narrative phase par excellence. And then and these are, I'm giving you some key points that I work with, they're not in any particular order. I like to say that the key to helping people grow old, not just get old, is helping them to develop good, strong stories. And I can say more about that later. We had a workshop at our university uh, back in April, still had snow on the ground, I have to say, um, open to about 35 older adults from our Fredericton area. And as, they, as these people arrived for the workshop, this was the third in a series, I had sense as they came through the door and found their table groups and were getting ready for the day of exploring ways to write and tell your story, that they were just bursting with their own narratives. They couldn't wait to have this opportunity through this workshop to get their stories out so that they could celebrate the lives that they have lived and are continuing to live. So that's narrative gerontology, all you need to know. Cole's notes, right? My next big topic is narrative identity. So a couple of quotations here. First one is a very important one from the uh, narrative psychologist Dan McAdams, uh, with whose work a number of you, I'm sure, are familiar. If not, it would be good for you to be familiar. Uh, based at Northwestern University, they have uh, the, Jane, the Foley Life Story Center, which would be a, a great, uh, I think a really great uh, center to make links with, with your center here. Uh, identity, and he's using Erickson's concept of identity, is a life story. An internalized and evolving narrative or personal myth, as he says in another place, of the self that provides life with a sense of unity and purpose. Let's hold on to that notion of identity. Whatever else it is, is a life story. Another French quotation by the novelist Gustave Flaubert. Everyone's life is worth a novel. Well, of course he would say that. He's a novelist. He sees potential novels everywhere he goes. Okay. And Harry Glishian, who is a narrative therapist, our destinies are open or closed in terms of the stories that we construct to understand our experiences. Well, again, this, this notion that identity, Erickson's very powerful concept of identity, whatever else it might be, it is about a story. If someone asks me to tell them about myself, I don't rattle off a bunch of statistics. Well, I'm five foot eight, well, probably five, seven and a half, because as I get older, I'm getting more down to earth. <laughs> and I weigh so many pounds, and I have a shoe size such and such. I don't tend to rattle off numbers and statistics, okay? I tend to tell some sort of version of my story. Well, I was born at a very young age, and, uh, <laughs> you know, I lived, I grew up in Harvey Station, etc., 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 depending on how interested I think my listener is in, in my whole story. Um, so this, my, when I think of my life, when you think of your life, I'm going to suggest, you think not of the stats, not of the facts, so much as your stories. Um, this, is, this is something that I think is critical from a cognitive perspective, is that we turn the stuff of our lives, or much of the stuff, not all of the stuff of our lives, into stories. Or in Jerome Bruner's uh, Expression. Jerome Bruner is one of the grandfathers, I think, of narrative psychology. In fact, I heard him speak at the conference that you folks were at as well uh, in Paris a couple of years ago. 97 years of age, talk about narrative openness, still going strong. He gave a fantastic keynote address, you know. This is the guy who wrote Life uh, as Narrative back in 1987, a foundational <laughs> article that I hope many of you have uh, had a chance to read. We turn, we turn life, he says, into text. We do that by uh, faculty, a, 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 a capacity or a capability that could go by various names, Nar narrative thought, narrative knowing, narrative intelligence, narrative imagination. And I like to point out that in many respects, memories, in this case I'm talking about autobiographical memories, are not so much the facts, man, as they are a complex blend of facts and elements of fiction, and editing and embellishment and interpretation, which we could call factions. 
memory is a matter of faction. Okay? I like that little play on words. Mary Catherine Bateson, her wonderful book, Composing a Life, that suggests that making a life is an aesthetic or a poetic process, a quasi-literary process. So those of you who have a literary background, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to bring your expertise to the topic of how we make and remake our lives as novels, the novelty of our lives, the uniqueness of our lives, and the story complexity and layeredness, and the, the quality of our lives in, the, in that there are many stories in one, with chapters, uh, with themes running through them, uh, with subplots that are tangled up in all kinds of fascinating ways, with a certain kind of atmosphere and tone and style. I like to speak of how we have storying styles as individuals. Um, and a certain genre, again, another one of those words which I try to pronounce when I get a ticklish nose. And a, 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 the novel of our lives is one of which we are at the, one and the same time author, or at best perhaps co-author, narrator, character, sometimes a central character, sometimes not so much, editor and reader. And Beth McKim and I had the chance to write the book called Reading Our Lives, where we take this idea of the reader uh, relationship that we have with our own lived texts as our starting point. Some more things to say about narrative identity, if you're not entirely asleep yet. Uh, autobiograph autobiography scholar John Paul, Paul John Eakin, in his book Making Selves, says there are many stories of self to tell and many selves to tell them. Those of you who have been, do who've been doing life story work and interviewing people, maybe you've got an appreciation for how, yes, there's many different stories that this person could share depending upon which self they're sort of operating from. When we talk about the, the library of our lives, those libraries contain all kinds of narrative material, short stories and long stories. The story about what I did last evening, the story about my first marriage, a long story. Or the story about the ten, the ten years that I spent in Saskatchewan, okay? Uh, we have very general stories, the stories about the sorts of things we used to do when we were kids, and quite specific stories. The one time that I slid down that hill and I ran right into a barbed wire fence, and that's a true story for me. I still remember it. Told stories, or stories that we can tell, the stories that we don't know how to tell, that perhaps are untellable. Uh, big stories, small stories, past stories, future stories, the list goes on. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff in our individual libraries. I like to focus, though, in terms of identity, on the special role of what various scholars call self-defining memories, nuclear episodes, that's um, Dan McAdams term, turning points, set pieces, or what Gary Kenyon and I uh, have referred to as signature stories. We each the idea here is that we each carry around inside of us a collection, a repertoire of signature stories that we hear ourselves trot out every now and again when perhaps we're in, we're in one of those new hello my name is situations and we're trying to give the other person some sense of who we are. One of my signature stories, and I can talk about it later, I think I referred to it in the workshop in Paris last year, some of you will remember, my iron lung story. Did I share that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, when I was two years of age, I had polio, like, as did my two sisters, and for two weeks, I was consigned to an iron lung. Okay? This was before Medicare, before the salt vaccine, and so forth. I'll stop it there, and maybe we'll come back to it, because there's more to that story. But that's, that's a, I've heard myself recount that iron lung story in lots of situations where maybe I've been trying to get a little bit of sympathy across the punch bowl. <laughs> You were in an iron lung? That must have been so well. What are you going to do, you know? <laughs> Our stories live us as much as we live them. This is a, an insight that I think comes loudly and clearly from the narrative therapy community. We live within our own unique story world. We sometimes say, oh, well, she lives in her own little world. Well, we all do from a narrative perspective. We're all living in our own unique story world. There's a meshing and inner and interchanging perhaps from one person's story world to another, but we live within the stories we are. And I, this is a phrase I keep kind of used it from my first book, and I, I keep thinking that we, and we don't just have stories or can tell stories, we on some level are our stories. Some more quotations before we switch to the next uh, central concept I want to share with you. I love this quotation from William Bridges, who was an English professor 
And then he turned psychotherapist. He had a conversion experience, I guess. And he wrote a wonderful little book called Transitions, Making Sense of Life's Changes, 1971. Great quotes. Uh, you can mine that book for lots of juicy quotes. We are like stories that are slowly unfolding according to our own inner theme and plot. And then he makes the added comment that this is why each of us is a kind of a coherent story world that has a built-in immune system, which explains why we resist change. Another quotation from Christina Baldwin, make our lives bigger or smaller, more expansive or more limited, according to the interpretation of life that is our story. And then from Donald Polkinghorne, his masterful book, 1988, Narrative Knowing in the Human Sciences. I hope you can get it for your uh, library in your center at some point. We are in the middle of our stories and cannot be sure how they will end. We're constantly having to revise the plot as new events are added to our lives. Which leads me now to this concept of narrative development. Our lives are not static. Our lives as novels uh, are not static things. We're, they're not cast in stone. They're constantly changing, thickening, and so forth. We get thicker as we get older, all right? Maybe thick-headed, maybe thick-waisted, whatever, but we become thicker of soul and story as we get older. Uh, ideally, and this is a cont controversial notion, again, that Don, Dan McAdams puts forward, ideally he would say, our stories develop, our life stories develop in the direction of what he calls good life story form, by which he means such criteria as coherence. The stories that we entertain of our lives hopefully hang together. Uh, they have a credibility. They're not sort of just illusion and fantasy, but they're linked to real things that we've actually gone through. There's, a, there's an element of differentiation uh, in our life stories. They're not just sort of one sort of main plot and that's it, but lots of subplots and so forth. There's a quality of openness to good life story form as opposed to closed downness. Reconciliation, which is the quality of being able to bring into our life stories the difficult stuff, the painful stuff, the traumatic stuff. Not to ignore that, not to sweep it under the rug, but to bring that into our story and thereby expand and thicken our stories. The truth value, I get into the whole question of narrative truth versus historical truth, and I'm sure in some of the interviews that you do, this question comes up, is what I'm hearing true? And if so, true in what sense? Did it really happen? Does it matter if it really happened? There's a great story here. I mean, when I think of some of my autobiographical memories, including my, my iron lung story, the actual fact is there's a lot of myth-making going on in there, okay? But it makes for a good story. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that possibly later. Dan McAdams, on this notion of narrative development, speaks in one of his articles, Narrating the Self in Adulthood, about the stages of storying and restoring that our narrative identity uh, undergoes. He talks about the pre-mythic, the mythic, and the post-mythic. The pre-mythic is the sort of early childhood uh, stage of our lives when we're, he would say, gathering material. We're having events and experiences and those tend to become sort of uh, key points, perhaps, in our story about the early part of our lives. The mythic period goes from adolescence straight on to mid and even early late adulthood, and that's what we are. That's the stage we move into when we begin to take narrative agency of our lives. We begin to ask, as teenagers do, "Who am I? What is my story?" As opposed to my mum's story of me, or my buddies or pals or siblings' story of me. Where have I come from? Uh, why am I here and where am I going? And that's a very, very rich period, very frustrating for parents perhaps, but a very rich period in terms of narrative development. Then the post-mythic stage, uh, he would suggest, he's not a gerontologist, is when we're looking back on our lives as stories and trying to sort of assess, make sense, and so forth. The key is that in later life, here, here's the gerontologist speaking, identity work and therefore, narrative development still goes on right up to the very end. My dad is 96. He's older than I am. And many of our parents are that way. It's a funny thing. And he still, thank God, got his, uh, his um, faculties about him, as does mother. Thank goodness she does, because if she didn't have her faculties, he would be bereft. I mean, she, well, anyway, we'll get into that. You, you know about that, Laura. Emma, where is my tea? You know? <laughs> um, but he's sharp. He's alert. He's biographically active. And you, you can just feel that there's still identity work going on. Okay? I'll come back to that later. 
Another thing on narrative, on the topic of narrative development, and this is, I get this from Mark Freeman at Worcester, Massachusetts, is that narrative development, moving forward in the development of our stories, our life stories, is contingent on our capacity to look back, or hindsight, which is the title of his 2010 book. And looking back and being able to discern patterns in our lives, to make meaning or remake meaning of previous events. That, and that enables us to move forward. You, you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been, that sort of idea. The developmental tasks of later life, here's the gerontologist speaking again, are narrative tasks in many respects. There's a story work that awaits us to be done, hopefully with the help of people like yourselves who are doing interviews or trying to help people tell and explore their stories. I'm going to jump over that, uh, that next point a little bit there, but I think that generativity is, is, it has a narrative dimension to it. Seeing our lives, our individual lives, in the context of our larger family or of our community. Okay? Ego integrity, another Ericksonian term, is, is about nothing if not pulling ourselves together, integrating uh, the, the pluses, the minus, the positives, the negatives of our lives into our story. Um, again, Beth and I have talked about reading our lives, and we make the point in, at, uh, in, in our book about the tragedy of the unread novel. Let's say you spent a good chunk of your life writing the great American novel, okay? And you finally find a publisher, and you get it published, and it goes on the bookstore shelves or the library shelves, and nobody buys it, and nobody takes it out, and nobody reads it, okay? I think there are a lot of unread or underread life stories in our midst at any given time, and there's a certain tragic quality to that. The other point I want to make is that their narrative development has no built-in limit to it. Biologically, there does seem to be a limit. 120 years of age, you know? Jeanne Calbert was a French woman who lived to be 122. She outlived her lawyer. There's a whole story about that. She kept on smoking her Gaulois cigarettes and drinking her glass or two of wine every day, and she lived to be 122. But that's kind of the limit, all right? But narratively speaking, autobiographically speaking, there is no limit to how much and deep and far we can grow. That's what I would like to leave you with on that, that point. I think we have a colleague of Robin Fivish here with us this evening from, hi, how are you? Um, Natalie. Natalie, hi Natalie, welcome. Um, pardon me? You're welcome. <laughs> We're so polite. That's the thing about Georgian people. <laughs> I can't get over it. You're almost like Canadians. <laughs> but uh, Natalie and, and Robin Fivish at Emory and other colleagues over the years have been doing some very interesting work, I feel, about gender differences in uh, narrative development. And the classic study that I think back to, and this is probably a number of years ago now, is uh, uh, observations of interactions between uh, little children and their parents, or little girls and their moms. And the, the, the discovery was that little girls are coached, if you will, by their moms to tend to tell more elaborate, more nuanced uh, stories about the events in their little two-year-old or three-year-old or four-year-old lives. <laughs> Conversely, little boys are more likely to be encouraged to stick to the facts. So what I'm wondering is, as a gerontologist, is over the lifespan, if there's validity to this insight that women or, 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 or young girls and so forth tend to develop more nuanced, more complex, thicker stories, then when they reach later life, they have already kind of a built-in resource that a lot of guys, us guys, don't have. And maybe that's one reason why uh, we men don't tend to live as long. Okay, and I, I, this, is, this is controversial territory, and I don't want to stake my life on it, but I, I commend you and your, your, uh, your colleagues uh, for this kind of work. I know you're doing some more uh, recent stuff as well. Anyway, narrative development is neither A, I'm, I'm really impressed with this word, atomistic, I, made, I made this up, or automa nor, nor automatic, okay? I like that little uh, alliteration. Uh, <laughs> Just to prep, prep us for this, because we're talking about narrative environment now, which is a fascinating concept. This is William Bridges again. He says, um, to become a couple is to agree implicitly to live in terms of another person's story. And then he adds, but it often takes time to get the part down really well. <laughs> okay? Roger Shank, another great quotation. And then Salman Rushdie, um, who has experienced a great deal of... Um, 
controversy, I guess you might say, for his, uh, his uh, fiction and so forth. But he says this in one of his writings, those who do not have power over the story that dominates their lives, the power to retell it, rethink it, deconstruct it, joke about it, and change it as times change, truly are powerless because they cannot think new thoughts. A lot in that, isn't it? You can have a whole course just on that one quotation. I'll say a few things that we'll, we'll touch on that. So narrative environment, we don't compose our lives as stories in a vacuum, but within a complex intertwining web of larger stories still. Uh, or within what I would call narrative environments. What's a narrative environment, you wonder? I'll try to explain by giving you an example. The last few days I have made a journey from Fredericton, New Brunswick to Atlanta, Georgia, where we are now. I've gone through a number of noticeable narrative environments. Uh, in New Brunswick, it's not uncommon to have somebody say, how is she going there, boy? Okay? When I got down to Portland, Maine, Portland, Maine, you can't get there from here. I flew over Boston where you pack your car and have it yard. We landed in Newark where people seem to talk really loud and fast, a real strong accent. And then I arrived in Atlanta, Georgia, where people are saying, honey, how are you? Do you have a nice trip? <laughs> Very definitely, in terms of accents, in terms of the way people talk to each other, the way the sayings that people use, okay? And that's just it in the English world. When you switch from, uh, you know, America to France, I mean, they've got a whole different language. So narrative environment is a, com for me, it's a complex, multi-layered notion that has a lot of power in it. Um, they're contexts within which we story our lives. I'm going to get to some examples. They have their own sort of codes, explicit or implicit, uh, for telling and listening, for narratively interacting. Uh, they are the mediators or conveyors of, of narrative templates or scripts for storying our lives, what Bruner calls forms of self-telling. And narrative environments, macro and micro, can be thick or thin, Positive or negative, I know it's a bit of a binary sort of a concept, uh, open or closed, flexible or rigid. So let's look a little bit at micro-narrative environments. Well, first off, I think you could suggest that each of us is and has our own narrative environment at work within us at any given time. There's a me, myself, and I that's nattering away and having a conversation uh, inside of our heads, okay? But more obviously, there is the narrative environment of our families, of the family in which we had been shaped, okay? When I was a kid, a thousand years ago, I lived with my parents, which often you do, and my father was, still is, I guess, uh, a, a United Church of Canada minister. So we lived in a small rural community in the minister's house, the manse. And around the supper table, uh, every day, there was a definite sort of sense as to who could say what, about what, in what way, to whom. Dad had more airtime, because he was a minister, after all, and he was of the old style of being a dad. And we kids were kind of, uh, you know, kids are to be seen and not heard. That, that was the generation. When I got a chance to go visit my buddy, Allie Wood, uh, who lived at the end of the bus line out in the country on a farm, and I was invited to the supper table at the Wood household. It was a different narrative environment. Of course, I was the guest, and maybe they were trying to impress me because I was the minister's kid, I don't know. But I felt like I'd, I could say whatever I wanted to. I could trot out my dumb jokes, and people would actually laugh at them. <laughs> I felt accepted. Then I had to go back home, all right? Nothing against my home, but every family has its own distinctive, unique narrative environment. And it goes in so many different ways and affects how we story our lives on so many different levels. But an interview uh, context where you're interviewing a research participant, that is a narrative environment, hopefully an open one, an inviting one, where you get good material from your interview subject. Uh, friendships are narrative environments. Each of us have, has a number of different friends, and each friend we enjoy a different type of narrative environment with, okay? There's certain things you can tell some of your friends, Marlon, that you can't tell others because they're, they're a different friend, okay? They have a different story of you and you have a different story of them. Um, a therapeutic relationship as a narrative environment, I don't think I need to stress that. A church as a narrative environment. Years ago, 
I was a minister in rural Saskatchewan. I don't know if you know where Saskatchewan is. It's way up north. And I had five points, five, a five-point parish in a 200-square-mile area. And it was an interesting experience for me on Sunday morning because I had to go to three and sometimes four of those churches to give a service. Okay, not, not all in the morning, but each of them had, each church, each congregation had a different sort of, there was a different feel to it. The narrative environments are things that you feel as much as you can sort of, uh, you know, uh, consciously uh, sort of articulate. There was a different feel to each of those congregations, as there was to the communities in which they were embedded. Institutions, Mercer University has perhaps an identifiably different type of overall narrative environment than Georgia Tech, than St. Thomas University. Okay? Okay, I think you get the point. Nursing homes. <laughs> I can come back to that later. Macro narrative environments are the larger meta-narratives, if you will, the larger master stories of culture, class, political systems, gender, race, science, and religion. But I'll, I'll focus on religion for the second, because I'm, I'm more familiar with that. A, a, a religion, a spiritual tradition, whatever else it might be for us, is on some level a master narrative about the world and who we are within that world, where we've come from, why we're here, where we're going. Okay? And that master narrative, or that grand story, Meta narrative can provide us with so many resources, helpful or maybe not helpful, for storing our individual lives. The point is that both macro and micro narrative environments can profoundly shape our lives, either enabling or inhibiting our narrative development, narrative development, re helping to restore us, or in some cases, sadly, de story us. Okay, shall we take a break and go have a coffee somewhere? <laughs> I have to do all the work. I'm enjoying this. Um, so some more quotes, because I'm moving to the next major topic, which is narrative disorders, which I'm nervous about. Because okay? I'm, I'm in a room with people who have expertise in psychology and psychiatry and counseling, so I'm way, way out of my league. But here's some quotations. Gene Houston, if we keep telling the same sad, small story, we'll keep living the same sad, small life. Hey. Okay? <laughs> And then there's another French guy, Guy de Maupassant. <laughs> Each of us makes for himself an illusion of a world poetic, sentimental, joyful, melancholic, ugly, or gloomy, according to his nature. Each of us has a storying style, or, or multiple storying styles. And then lastly, from Mark Freeman again in Worcester, Massachusetts, Narrative foreclosure is the premature <laughs> conviction that the story of one's life has effectively ended, that the future is a foregone conclusion, that no new chapters or themes are apt to open up. Your life goes on, you go through the motions, but in your heart, in your mind, in your imagination, the story is all but over. When I'm sitting at my favorite coffee shop in Fredericton, New Brunswick, doing my thing, and who has a Canadian connection here apart from my niece, Laura? Who has ever heard of Tim Hortons? Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Tim Hortons is to Canada as Starbucks and uh, Dunkin' Donuts together are to the United States of America. <laughs> all right? It's an institution, all right? And everyone looks pretty much the same. So there's a narrative environment, sort of, whether you're in Toronto or Frederick. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is I go there a lot and I observe people. I overhear people, I don't, for goodness sake, I don't listen in, I'm not a gossiper. But I overhear some of the guys talking, this is maybe sort of the gender differences, and they wonder, the retirees, they wander in, you know, well, how are you doing today? Oh, not too bad. Can't go out golfing because my hip is hurting me and so forth. And I have this sense that for some of these people, I'm judging here perhaps, that there is a narrative foreclosure at work. You know, their life goes on, you know, but they've kind of shut down on some level. How can we help them open their stories back up? That's our challenge as counselors and so forth. Narrative disorders. Ooh, I'm nervous about this. And that's why I have the word disorders in quotation marks. And I'm, I'm, I'm blaming Paul John Eakin for even saying this. In his book, Making Selves, he suggests that he's not a biography scholar, so he studies how people make stories about their lives, if you're out of body. He says, many, perhaps, identity disorders are on some level narrative disorders. 
um, they're, they're disorders, using that word in quotation marks, in how we story our lives. And they're oftentimes, I think, a function of, of narrative environments. There's a link between that. So the first one I, I could just, I'm just throwing some of these out here as possible things for us to think about, narrative foreclosure. Uh, when we have shut our story down, or we have allowed other people to shut our story down because they have stereotyped us, <laughs> and we've bought their, their stereotype and uh, accepted uh, our, uh, our fate, okay? Um, but narrative foreclosure, and some of us, uh, my Netherlands colleagues, have been looking at narrative foreclosure as something that we can experience vis-a-vis -vis the past, but also the future, or the future, but also the past. Here I think of Robert Frost, poet, uh, who was interviewed once about, he was asked the question, so Mr. Frost, yes, what are your, what are your, what are your thoughts for the, do you have hope for the future? He said, yes, and also for the past. Profound answer when you think about it. The possibility that we can go back and restory the past and come up with a more livable version of what our lives have been. There's a, there's a quip that's used in the psychiatric community, apparently. You're, you're never too old to have a happy childhood. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know more about this than I do, but I throw that out for you. Narrative loneliness. Some Danish colleagues of, of ours at the Narrative Center in Fredericton have been doing some interesting work with life story groups of uh, seven or eight Danish older adults who are living kind of isolated lives in the community, whether it's in Copenhagen or a surrounding community. And it's as if they, they have lost the witnesses to their stories in their lives. They've lost a spouse, they've lost uh, children, family members, neighbors who've moved on or, or, or passed on, and they're experiencing what my colleague called a narrative loneliness. And what my other colleague Clyde Baldwin calls narrative loss which I think can be a factor in the late life depression that many people can experience. Sort of mid-grade, maybe low-grade depression. You can, you can work with that if you want to. Narrative knots, when I was at, uh, uh, here at Atlanta the last time, I was talking to some uh, PhD students at Emory uh, in the Interdisciplinary Liberal Arts PhD program. And one of them, students, made this fascinating concept about, we were talking about narrative therapy, about narrative knots that people can have. Sort of, you know, we have a knot in your stomach, okay? And until you can tell somebody what's bugging you, you have that knot remaining in your stomach. But you, you get it out, you kind of get the bits of the story out in some sort of form, you untangle the knot, and you can move on. Um, narrative contamination is a, is a Dan McAdams uh, concept. I want to just talk quickly about narrative impoverishment. Growing up in an environment where there just are literally not a lot of stories, uh, that are being told or that are there to, 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 to read or to watch or to hear, uh, that can, can contribute perhaps to one being impoverished in one's own self-storying over time. My colleague John McIndy from the Narrative Center in Fredericton, who passed away tragically a number of years ago, he was murdered. That's a whole story in itself. It shook the foundations of our little university. He was a wonderful guy. And before he died, he had been doing interviews with men in penitentiaries in Canada. And he found that, that many of the people, men he was interviewing, had a difficult time stringing a story about their lives together. Because the narrative environment of the prison was such that, you know, you don't talk to other guys. You don't go into depth. You know, you keep it on the surface or whatever you do. I've never been into prison, thank goodness. Not yet, anyway. And he talked about how some of the, the, the guys he was talking to just gave kind of little bits and pieces as they tried to, to piece, put together a, a life story that, that made sense to them, and they couldn't do it. So he said there was a lot of narrative debris. I don't know, I, I just throw that notion out. And the narrative domination, um, where our stories are dominated by a particular memory, by a trauma that we've not been able to resolve, by a partner who is uh, sort of the main character in our story, and we find no way to move forward from that, or we're dominated by a, a religious perspective that, uh, in a sense, holds us down, or we can be dominated by our own ego. So we have a particular story about our lives, and we are sticking to it. Okay? Um, which leads me to this little picture here. I wonder if you wanted to use that in some of your uh, seminar discussions sometime. What do you want to say to this guy? Let it go. Let it go. Drop it. 
You know? <laughs> He's in a real dilemma, okay? Uh, I'll just leave it at that. But just the narrative roots, and I am not a psychologist with her, the narrative roots to depression, you know? I'm sure this is not, not a rock and science revolution, revelation for most of you. We're moving right along. Um, got a few more quotes here. There is no agony like bearing an untold story inside of you. We all have had that experience, I'm sure, on different occasions. We go through stuff, may not be huge stuff, may not be worthy of being on TV, but we wonder, who can I tell this story to? How do I begin? Where, is there going to be a listener available for me to, to get this story out so that I can deal with it? You can't tell who you are unless someone is listening. Narrative care is my next big topic, and... Uh, so narrative care, we could go on the whole rest of the evening for this. Um, let me give you a quick example of what narrative care means for me. My 96-year-old dad, a few years ago, uh, decided that he and mother needed to think ahead. They were living in, they still are living in their own apartment in a senior-friendly uh, apartment building. But we need to think ahead because we we're going to have to go into a nursing home at some point, one or the other of us. So, I took them on a tour at their request of a large local nursing home. My friend Ken McGeorge, the CEO, was taking them along, dad with his walker, mother with her cane, taking them along through the different uh, uh, sections of this quite newly renovated nursing home. And he was trying to sell them, you know, I could tell that. And they were, they were impressed, sort of. As, the, as we were walking along, dad noticed this elderly woman, obviously a resident of the nursing home, sitting slumped over in a wheelchair facing the wall. Kind of an archetypal situation. You know, we've, we see a lot of this in lots of nursing homes, I'm sure. He had, in that instant of seeing this woman, he noticed the name tag on the back of her, of her um, wheelchair, Mrs. Culloden, Mrs. Viola Culloden, whatever it was. I can't remember exactly. So he, he scrouched down, he, he, he's 90-something himself. He scrouched down, kind of caught her eye, and he said to her, because he, he knew as a pastor, he knows all the little communities in the surrounding area, you wouldn't be from up around Stanley, would you? Stanley's a little community outside of her. Well, yes, I would. <laughs> and she sat up in her chair. I watched this. She sat up in her chair. She had a smile come across her face. She, her posture was better, a color came into her face, and for just maybe a minute and a half, she was recognized as an individual who had a story and has a story, okay? And I use that example as a, just kind of a miniature illustration of what narrative care is at its heart. It's recognizing that the individuals with whom we deal, young, old, whatever, have unique stories. They've got novels going on just as we do. So it's listening or attending respectfully and non-judgingly to, but just as importantly, for a person's story. Um, I'm going to jump over a couple of points here because I think a lot of this is self-explicatory. Um, I've written here in the margins, how you tell your story hinges hugely on who's listening and how. On, from time to time, I go see a counselor friend of mine to get a kind of a tune-up. Right? Things I want to talk out, sort through. Uh, after I've had an hour with this guy, Jeff is his name, I, I have to pay him, so you know, <laughs> I'm conscious of getting the best use of my time. I come out of that office feeling better about me, feeling richer, thicker, stronger in my own story. The problem that I came to talk hasn't disappeared. It hasn't magically evaporated. It's still there. I've got to deal with stuff but I feel fuller and stronger in me, okay? Which leads me to, that, to, talk, to mention this wonderful quotation from, which is the title of a book. Some of you perhaps have run across it. It's written by a couple of um, Aboriginal uh, narrative therapists in Australia. The book is entitled, Telling Our Stories in Ways That Make Us Stronger. I love that. And the last little bit there, and this is a student of mine, said, you know, if we can think of difficult periods in our lives as chapters that we kind of have to go through because they're part of our story, then we can more easily move on to be open to the next chapter. I thought, wow, that's brilliant. Simple, but brilliant, as many brilliant things are. 
Context for narrative care, you know all of this more than I do. It can be formal, they can be informal. Uh, acute care, long-term care, palliative care, pastoral care. Uh, therapy, obviously, is if nothing if not, the therapeutic process is nothing if not a narrative process. People tell their stories, their, those stories are listened to and reframed and restoried, and uh, uh, there's, a, there's a narrative development process that definitely goes on. Um, various strategies, various benefits. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to some of those when I talk about narrative self-care. The benefits of narrative care, here I'm referring to my, my uh, Dutch colleagues, Ernst Bollmeier, Herman Westerhoff, and company. They've been helping me as a narrative gerontologist by gathering the data that shows that narrative interventions with older adults experiencing some degree of depression using life review or integrative reminiscence or creative reminiscence actually makes a measurable, not miserable, but measurable difference <laughs> in terms of those individuals' sense of personal meaning, their sense of personal mastery, and lowering their experience of depression, not just at the time, but three, four, six months after the fact. Uh, narrative care, last point here, is core care, okay? It, because it goes to the heart of a person's identity. Um, I need to end on self-care because I think that's very important. If we are going to, um, I love this first quote by Patricia Hampel, the memoirist, if we learn not only to tell um, our stories, but to listen to what our stories tell us, if we read our lives, then we are doing the work of memory. Okay? And then the last quote, Florence Scott Maxwell, do you know her work? When you truly possess all you have been and done, which may take some time, you're fierce with reality. So narrative self-care. If we're going, it seems to me, if we're going to present ourselves as agents of narrative care to other people, young, old, or whatever, it behooves us, if we're going to help other people appreciate the richness and complexity and thickness and interestingness and mystery and openness of their own stories, we need to be doing work that helps us to appreciate the richness and thickness and complexity and openness and mystery of our own story. So if you have time, even if you don't have time, take time. This is my recipe for your summer. Wherever you go to spend a little you time, uh, whether it's a cottage up on a lake or you go to a beach somewhere, I hope you'll take some time uh, throughout the summer to do some of that personal story work that is so, so essential. I'm sure you do that anyway in your, in your counseling courses, etc. cetera. Um, strategies for doing personal story work. Oh gosh, the, the list goes on. Even just making a simple lifeline, okay? Where well, you draw a straight line and you go, the high points, the low points, the high points, the low points, you know, from when you were a kid up till now. That's a start. I like to make lists, okay? Uh, lists of places that I've been, lists of people that I know that I've met in those places. It seems like a very primitive sort of thing to do, but it's a way of helping me to expand my sense of my own story. Okay? Um, we had an exercise in one of our uh, workshops back in New Brunswick where we invited people to list the different houses or apartments that they'd lived in over the years. And that turned out to be a very powerful exercise uh, because, you know, when you think, well, when I grew up in that house, I've forgotten about that house and all the memories that are associated with that house and the room that I kind of enjoy going into, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a way of kind of pulling yourself together, pulling the different parts of your story together. Genealogy. Uh, many of you have an interest in genealogy or developing an interest in genealogy. I think this is really, really important because if we can appreciate the, the, the richness and the complexity of our family story, it's a, it's, it's a way of broadening our sense of the larger story that, that we live within. Uh, and it's a, it's a movement in the direction of developing what I call a, having a good, strong story about our lives. Um, some ongoing considerations. I'm just about done here. Uh, obviously, narrative and dementia presents a, a, a series of questions for us. But let us not forget that people with various degrees of dementia can still be autobiographically alive and active but maybe in ways that we don't normally appreciate because we have maybe a narrow notion of what a story, a good story, a narrative is about. Okay? And also, we have the opportunity to hold and to honor people's stories for them and with them. And that reminds us that, you know what, we're all linked together 
in co-authoring connections of wonderful sorts all the time. Um, the narrative complexity of ordinary life and love. <laughs> uh, gee, I, whew, we could go off on a... But here's something that just came to me yesterday, two days ago rather, sitting in airports. Now airports are special places, they're kind of lonely places, aren't they? But how many times I noticed that people were sitting here, sitting there, sitting there. I saw this in Starbucks too yesterday with Karen Shai. People were having not conversations with each other, but looking at a screen, interacting with a device. Now that's not to say they weren't having conversations, texting, whatever, and so forth, but it did kind of make me wonder, okay, as we move forward into this technologically dominated future, are we losing something? Yes, we're gaining something, but are we losing? What is it that we're losing in terms of appreciation of the narrative richness of our own lives and other people's lives? I'll leave that for you to ponder. My last little thing is here, articulating a narrative theology of aging. My personal agenda in the coming years, if I can, is to bring together sort of the three major strands that have shaped the way I'm thinking and so forth over the last 20, 30 years, the whole narrative thing, which goes off in so many different directions. Uh, by the way, I appreciate the focus of your center, because as Don and I were talking, narrative can take you off in so many different esoteric uh, directions into the minute sort of complexities of literary theory and narratology and so forth, and that's fascinating. But I love the bring it home quality to narrative, that it makes a difference potentially makes a positive difference, a healing difference in people's lives. Um, but that strand, the narrative strand, the theological, spiritual, religious strand that's obviously been part of my life, and aging. And I think that aging itself is an implicitly spiritual experience. That leads me to the last slide, which is questions, comments, yabats, and thank you very much. Thank you.